Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today, and um, especially for the keynote session for Nurturing Developing Minds uh, 2022, Strengthening Families. So we are looking forward to a great session. Uh, I just want to go through a few logistics um, before we begin. This session is being recorded, and the chat is being archived. Attendees, you are in view only mode just to keep things orderly so you can't use your microphone. We encourage you to use the chat box um, throughout this session to engage with the group. You can post here for any technical, experience, uh, technical issues you experience as well as any questions you would like to share with presenters. And we will share those questions um, toward the end of the session. So this session does use auto captioning. While these captions will not be exact, we hope they can improve accessibility for all the attendees. To activate these as a viewer, please look for an option on your, on your toolbar that says live transcript and select either subtitles or full transcript, which will appear as a sub bar. So your options may differ if you're on a mobile device. Um, a recording of the session will also be made available on our YouTube page. So just a quick note on professional development credits. If you are intending to claim professional development credit through South Carolina Endeavors for early educators, please complete the submission form we're about to share in the chat box before the end of the session. This is essential that so we have the information that you need to process your credits. And remember that you must attend the session for the full one hour duration to receive credit. These sessions are also eligible for CME credits. Um, further information, including the link to complete your attestation form will be sent in a follow-up email next week. And for CME and all other professional development credits, ICS will be happy to provide verification of attendance. Um, for that and other professional development inquiries, please contact uh, John Young Sheik Conklin, um, and we will put that, um, we will put that, uh, um, uh, address in the chat box as well. If you have questions about this process, please return to the lobby in Zoom after this session where someone can assist you. So we wanna, if anyone's having any technical problems or anything at all, please, please just let us know so we can help out. So at this time, I am so pleased to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Carol Weitzman is a developmental behavioral pediatrician who is one of the leaders in our field. Um, she spent most of her career at Yale University School of Medicine, where she is now a professor emeritus of pediatrics, but not content to rest on her laurels, which most of us would do after achieving uh, professor emeritus status. She's continuing her work at the Harvard School of Medicine as the co-director of, of the Autism Spectrum Center at Boston Children's Hospital. And she really has too many accolades for me to quickly encapsulate. So I'm just going to give you um, a few of her most recent accomplishments. Nationally, she is the immediate past president of the Society for Development, Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics. She is also the immediate past chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on developmental behavioral pediatrics. And she is a current member of the American Board of Pediatrics Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics Subboard Certifying Committee. She has many, many important publications, but related to this presentation, Dr. Weitzman is the first author of the AAP Clinical Report, Promoting Optimal Development, Screening for Behavioral and Emotional Problems, and is first author on the current revision. She has always been passionate about resiliency in families and has been closely involved in multiple efforts um, at the AAP and SDBP related to children's developmental and behavioral health during COVID, including authoring the AAP interim guidance on supporting the emotional and behavioral health needs of children, adolescents, and families during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are delighted to have her with us today to speak, to speak on family resiliency in the era of COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Weitzman. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. And I will just tell you that I've used as my guiding principle, I think, in life that I sort of say, if Dr. Kelly and Dr. Macias did some of these things, then I'll try to do it too. So I've always just followed people I have tremendous respect for and it's taken me in a, decent, a pretty good path. So thank you guys for that. All right, let me just make sure, Michelle just nod, you can see my screen okay? 
Perfect. Excellent. So I'm delighted to be here, meaning being here in a virtual way. I'm sitting in Connecticut where it's cold and it's rainy and it's icy, wishing I was down there in warm, sunny South Carolina. And every time I give a talk like this, I say, this is absolutely going to be my last virtual talk because we'll be in person. And then, wow, it just keeps on going. So anyway, I'm delighted to be here to talk about family resiliency in the era of COVID and, and just so i um, excited kind of to hear your comments at the end because, you know, listening to sort of what an incredible diverse group of people um, are present today. It's, it's very exciting. Okay, so let me just, okay, there we go. I have nothing to disclose. And here's what I would like us to try to accomplish over our time together this morning. One is to know the prevalence of children's emotional and behavioral problems prior to COVID-19 appreciate the impact of COVID-19 on children's well-being and become familiar with how to promote resiliency. So I, we're gonna go on a little bit of a roller coaster ride. I feel like I'm gonna start off and kind of bring you down and there's gonna be a point where you're gonna feel kind of low, um, but I promise I'm not gonna leave you there and we're gonna go right back up and then use our time to think about um, how to lift up children and families and communities. So let's start on the down part, okay? We're going to start by thinking about setting the stage. Um, where were we at around children's behavior and development and well-being prior to the pandemic? This is going to be a review for a lot of you. I know that people um, uh, in this group are fairly familiar, but it's important to point it out. So what do we know? 13 to 20 percent of children and youth have behavior and developmental concerns at any given time. Oops, sorry, let me go back. With 30 to 37 to 39 percent of children will have a behavior or emotional disorder diagnosed by 16 years of age. And young children are affected too. One in six children ages two to eight years of age have a mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. In recent studies, sorry, my screen is going crazy today. Um, in a recent study that was done that looked at the prevalence and trends of developmental disabilities in children between 2009 and 2017, 9.5% of children were diagnosed with ADHD, 7.1% with anxiety, 7.4% with a behavioral problem, 2.5% with autism spectrum disorder. And when we look at things like suicide, suicide is now the second leading cause of death among US children and adults ages 15 to 24, and 41%, there's been a 41% increase in suicide rates among youth and young adults ages 15 to 24 between 2000 and 2017. I think we just have to pause for a minute and take in these statistics, and we must grapple with what is happening to the youth of our nation. This is all pre-COVID. In many ways, these statistics and these indices say we have just not got something right, that there are too many suffering children in this nation, that there is something about the way that we either are looking at disorder or expectations that we just don't have something right. With that in mind, let's also look at things like focusing on our social determinants. So we know that more than 10 million children in this country live in poverty, one half in extreme poverty, which means that that's um, a family of four living on approximately $13,000 a year. And of the group that live in poverty, approximately 71% of these children are children of color, one in four black children, one in five Hispanic and Native American children. 1.5 million children in this country have experienced homelessness and more than one in seven experienced food insecurity with nearly 50% of all public school students relying on free or reduced price meals. And that became so, came into focus so clearly during the lockdown of COVID um, that there were many children who were not receiving just adequate nutrition and food. So this is a country, we are a country of tremendous inequity and tremendous income disparity. So that's what we look like going into COVID. So now let's look at the consequences of COVID on children's mental health and well-being. I think the first thing we have to look at is kind of just the issues of loss. What is the magnitude of loss that children are facing in this country and in this world? So there were some modeling studies that were done 
that extrapolated globally between March of 2020 and April of 2021 and showed, and this is already old, you know, it's almost there's, so these numbers are, are, are going to be much larger now than what it was nearly a year ago. So more than 1.1 million children have experienced the death of primary caregivers, including at least one parent or custodial parent. And what about in our country, in the United States? More than 200,000 children in the United States have had a parent or a caregiver die from COVID-19. Um, Chuck Nelson called this COVID orphans. Um, what we know is for every four COVID-19 deaths between April 20 and June 30th, 2021, one child lost a parent or caregiver. So there's a huge amount of loss that children in this country have been experienced. And I really have to say that I feel like amongst all of the political noise and arguing and such that goes on around COVID in this nation, we cannot forget how painful the experience has been for so many people and for the purposes of our discussion today for the children of this country. And we know that these losses are disproportionately affecting children of color. One in 168 Native American or Alaska Native children, one in 310 Black children, one in 412 Hispanic children, as compared with one in 753 white children. And these losses are about 18 to 20% higher than what you would see in any typical year. For every death, people look at sort of like when there's a death of a person, sort of the waves, if you will, of loss, there are approximately nine people bereaved for every human being that, that um, passes away. These differences that we're seeing amongst children of color, they're also regional. So they're highest for Hispanic children along the Southern border, in the Southeast for black children and in tribal areas for American Indian Native American children. In addition to um, the loss of life, there's also been learning loss. And I know there's a lot of educators in this group and that's, I'm excited to hear from you afterwards. Um, but there's one to three million children never enrolled in school, showed up or logged in. That is a lot of children who had significant gaps in their educational trajectory. 25 million, that's the number of children, students who were physically out of school for 13 months beginning in March, 2020. And you know, of that huge number, there's gonna be all kinds of differential effects. And we're gonna talk about that later on. You know, from kids who come from well-resourced homes, access to the internet, parents available to help them meet their needs. The impact of that will be far less than for the children who are living in homes where they don't have reliable internet access where there aren't resources and families are not available for learning. So there's a big mixture of what happens to this tremendously huge group of children. A 30 point drop. That's just one example of a decrease in proficiency rates on state assessment tests in math in some grades from 2019 to 2021 in San Antonio. Now let's take a look at this. This is a good look at sort of seeing how are kids doing you know, in from the 2019 to 2020 in comparison to what it looked like before. So let me just orient you a little bit. This line where there's the line that's 100, I hope you can see that, is really kind of um, an, an average of achievement over the past three years prior to 2019, 2020. And then all of these bars are looking at academic achievement in different grades and in different areas of study. So what you notice in, immediately is that there's a disparity. There's a distinction and a loss of learning skills for almost everything, in fact, for everything um, in comparison to the previous three years. But what I want you to really pay attention to is that when you look at the light blue dots, those are schools with more than 50% white students, whereas the black dots are schools with more than 50% of students of color. And so what you can see is that there's even huge disparity for each and every metric when you look at children, schools that are predominantly attended by children of color. The next thing we need to look at when we think of the consequences of COVID are of course the mental health issues, which has taken this country by storm as we all know. So let's look at some of those numbers. There was a really good meta-analysis that was done that looked at the prevalence of anxiety and depression. This is across the world between January 2020 and March 2021. And again, 
you know, these are, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing what we continue to learn over time. What I liked about this study is they took a meta-analysis, they saw what studies, um, you know, uh, met criteria, they combined the samples. So they were looking at a sample of about of 80,870 participants. And what they found is the following, that one in five youth globally are experiencing clinically elevated anxiety and one in four youth were experiencing clinically elevated depression. Um, these statistics are essentially double those of pre-pandemic estimates. And what they found also is the studies went on is as, the, as COVID continued, the numbers of kids with anxiety and depression just continued to rise, which is not at all surprising, but it is worth noting. This slide, it's a busy slide, I'm gonna help us unpack it a little bit, is looking at ED visits for mental health and suicide attempts. So let's just take a look at what we've got going on this busy slide. So on the top is girls and the bottom is boys. These are weekly, each the, the x-axis are sort of the num week number in the year. And there's three years represented here. Sort of the light dotted line is 2019, the heavier dashed line 2020 and the solid line is 2021. All right, so what are our major take home messages? There's a lot to look at here, but the key points that I want us to make sure we take in. When we compare with the rate in 2019, there was a 31% increase in the proportion of mental health related emergency department visits occurred among adolescents ages 12 to 17 years in 2020. And that during the winter of 2021, and you can kind of see this line here, this hugely spiked line, um, ED visits for suspected suicide attempts were 50.6% higher among females compared with the same period in 2019. We know that when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden school-based mental health services were, were not available, where there was a dearth of mental health providers where kids were not getting um, counseling and support in person, a huge safety, couple that with increasing anxiety and depression, a huge safety net dropped out for children. And for anyone who works and has any contact with hospital systems knows that our emergency departments are filled with children awaiting placement for psychiatric beds and our inpatients have record numbers of borders of children who are awaiting placement in psychiatric, uh, for psychiatric beds. So it has become an incredible crisis in this nation. There was a survey done of um, parents sort of rating a number of different symptoms that they saw in their children since the pandemic began, concentrating on schoolwork, nervousness or being easily scared, difficulty with falling asleep or staying asleep, poor appetite or overeating, frequent headaches or stomach aches. And you can see people endorsed a lot of these, but the most, the, the one that stands out to me is that parents said, 42% of parents said that their children had experienced at least one of these symptoms. And this percentage was significantly higher in Hispanic parents. You cannot escape the headlines. They're all over the place. Officials warn that children's mental health worsens among the, amid the pandemic. You know, and it's interesting when I've talked to many primary care providers, I think they were all braced for that. There was gonna be a lot of, um, you know, illness due to COVID in children. And in fact, what's happened is that there's been this absolute crisis in mental health, which has taken people a bit by surprise in the intensity and magnitude of the problem. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Children's Hospital Association came together and declared a state of emergency on children's mental health. And as I just was telling you, children with psychiatric needs are overwhelming hospital emergency departments. Last week in the Washington Post, this is a good thing. Ron Wyden, um, chairman of the Finance Committee, has announced a goal of creating a bipartisan mental health package by this summer. It's something we are all going to have to pay a lot of attention to and figure out where to put our advocacy efforts and announced that there would be a bipartisan effort um, in five policy areas, bolstering mental health care among youth, shoring up the workforce, increasing coordination in the system, ensuring mental health is treated the same as physical health and easing access to telehealth services. It may be one actual bipartisan thing that this country can accomplish at this moment. All right, so I told you, 
I'm going to bring you down. So is everybody feeling, I can't see you, but I'm imagining just listening to this onslaught of, you know, just horribly negative things brings us very down. And so now we're going to try to figure out in the rest of this talk, like, well, where do we go from here? And I want to start with um, a message that's already been said this morning. Many of us are just worn out. It's been a long haul and it's not finished and we're still dealing with it. We're dealing with it personally. We're dealing with it professionally. We've had so many losses, large and small, so many things that have stretched us to our max. It's hard to kind of sometimes think about finding the energy to sort of muster, to muster new energy to dig into these problems. And I would say also, particularly for people who are, any, who are in the medical field, it's been an unprecedented time of tremendous attack and criticism of the medical world and honestly of science. So these things kind of just beat us down and you know, over two years, whoa, it's a lot. But I would tell you that I think there has never been a more important time to be in the business of caring for children. Because as I think I've just showed you, the, the, the children and the families of our nation are in a very precarious place and need voices of people across all the disciplines that you represent to be speaking up for and on behalf of children and family well-being. So when I think about COVID, I sort of started to think, oh my God, we're stuck in Groundhog Day. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. It's a very old movie. Um, and it's a great movie, but Bill Murray plays this kind of disgruntled um, weatherman and he goes down to Pennsylvania for Groundhog's Day and all of a sudden he gets stuck in this day and he wakes up and it's the same day over and over again. And that's sort of a little like what COVID felt like, you know, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. We're not getting out of it. But in this movie, what happened was through sort of trauma and repetition, he just started to see things differently he started to be bold. He started to imagine things different. He started to challenge his own beliefs. And through that came to all this new awareness about himself, about people, about the world around him. And ultimately it was through that kind of reflective um, thinking and risk-taking and you know, looking at the world in a different way that actually got him through. And that's what I think we need to do here. So Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Brilliant phrase, you know? So the truth is, if we do not learn from this experience, if we do not take this experience and think, what are we going to learn from this? We ultimately cannot heal, we cannot grow, we cannot improve, and we cannot make things any bit better for, um, for children and for families and communities. So I think that much of what we can do at this point, as COVID is maybe we're starting to see some fading of the Omicron, um, is start to think about how are we going to promote resilience and adapt and adaptation. And in fact, there is something to be said that trauma can promote growth. And in many ways, I feel like this responsibility falls to maybe some of us who possibly have weathered COVID from places of some position of comfort, meaning we had a roof over our heads, we had food on our tables, we had jobs, and we had still maintained some overall sense of well-being. Now, we often tend to look a lot at just the cracks and look at risk and adversity. And But what I would like to focus the remainder of this talk on is thinking about how do we promote flourishing? Because that, too, is a really important cornerstone in promoting um, of optimal development and well-being amongst children and families. So the first thing we have to do is think about how do we even define resilience? You know, and it's fascinating when you look at the resilience science because there's a lot of different areas of science that have looked at this, like looking at individual, looking at family, looking at after war, but also in things like looking in architecture and engineering and environment. And they all kind of come up with the same thing. Resilience is really about the strength to withstand a given level of stress without a loss of function. A capacity to adapt to adversity, stressful life events, and significant threats or trauma 
and the ability to recover from disruptions in a reasonable time frame. It's all about stress management. It's all about adaptation. And human beings have a remarkable ability for adaptation. And in fact, when you look at you know, young babies, you know, you look at some of these uh, movies of animals being born, they're up and they're running within like minutes after birth. Humans are not like that. But partly the, advent the advantage that we have is that it gives us um, being so dependent on our environment, gives us an opportunity to adapt really well to different situations. So it's within human beings to have the capacity to adapt and again, it's all about stress management. All right, I'm gonna tell you a little story to illustrate resilience. So a number of years ago, my husband and I were given this beautiful cactus, tall, erect, regal cactus, lovely. Didn't need a lot of maintenance. You just had to water it, not even a lot. And one day I came downstairs and the whole thing had just sort of wilted over. It was like such a traumatic thing to see. This beautiful regal cactus just wilted over. My husband said, oh, it's dead. Throw it away. It's no good. I said, no, 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 no. We've got to save this cactus. So I cut off what was what I thought were sort of the dead parts. I replanted it and I just watered it. And I thought for a long while, I think I'm watering a dead plant until all of a sudden about a year later, it came to life and it like exploded with growth, just exploded. And that's what my cactus looks like now. So it is not the tall regal cactus it once was, it's got things coming out all over the place. But that cactus adapted to a very serious trauma and it is flourishing. And people might say, well, is it more beautiful? Is it less beautiful? And my answer is, it doesn't matter. It's changed. It's different, but it's thriving and it's flourishing. And I kind of love the cactus for that. So let's move on now to talk a little bit about resilience. All right, so the original resiliency studies um, did sort of notice this. They noticed that there were some people who in the midst of terrible adversity seemed to be doing well or even thriving. And a lot of work went into trying to identify, well, what are those factors that are, what's happening? Like, why are these folks doing so much better than everybody else? And it was really interesting stuff. And then the later studies sort of looked at and tested, you know, well, what if we put some of those interventions in place? Can we promote resiliency in others? So this was super important work, but I wanna caution us because I think there's two issues that I wanna be aware of. Number one, when you look at resiliency like this and you only look at it like this, you come to a conclusion that resiliency is kind of a trait, that it's something static. Either you have it, you're resilient or you're not. Now, while individual differences certainly contribute to adaptive capacity, it's not a trait we can cultivate resiliency in people. We can do things to cultivate and build resiliency. So we don't wanna think about it as a static trait. The second thing that I think is also sometimes where resiliency science can be used in a very nefarious way is sort of looking at people who have done really well and then holding everybody else to that standard and sort of doing a little bit of blaming. Why aren't you more like that? And sort of withholding resources because we say, well, see, they did really well, so you all should do that too. And we should be very attuned to making sure when we see that happening. So this is how people think about resilience now as kind of a multi-level interconnected systems of resilience, looking at individuals, family, community, culture, and society. And people talk about developmental cascades. When a society is doing well, or doing poorly, it kind of flows in across cultures, communities, and families to the individual, and likewise outwards from the individual. When you look at COVID, I think this is a model to really pay attention to because in fact, we have had a trauma that has, that has impacted the entirety of our society, of our world, differentially in places, but that we can look at and think about then these kinds of cascades and these interconnected systems of resilience. When we talk about resilience, we can often talk about two kinds of factors. Number one is promotive factors. This is sort of a blanket kind of thing where there's better outcomes across any level of risk. 
And then there's those protective factors where there's kind of a laser focus, meaning specifically applied targeted interventions that are specifically implied in the context of high adversity. One of the best examples of factors that are both promotive and protective are parenting interventions. When we do things that help sort of all parents, um, there's just better outcomes across any level of risk. But when we see that there's areas of high adversity, we give specific kinds of intense parenting interventions, those are sort of protective factors. So we want to think about using both promotive and protective factors to build resiliency. I want to spend just but a minute on this slide because this is looking at sort of the biopsychosocial model of resilience. And we often spend a lot of time looking at the neural and brain impact of adversity, but I want us to look a little bit at the opposite, looking at how preventive and therapeutic interventions actually change neural circuitry. So let's start with looking at the bottom left genes. This is what you have. We all have genes that are protective and we all have genes that put us at risk for different things. So this is kind of what you got, but it's just a starting point, isn't it? And then if we go up here and we think about all the different preventive and therapeutic interventions that, are, um, that we have at our disposal to enhance resilience, they can sort of enact themselves in multiple ways. Number one is through direct impact of the environment by placing family and community supports, a direct impact on neural circuitry and on psychological factors in people, such as self-efficacy, optimism and positive emotions, cognitive reappraisal, cognitive reappraisal being the skill of being able to reevaluate stressful emotion eliciting events in less threatening ways. Now, this is the work, by the way, that comes out of um, the labs and the work of Steve Southwick and Dennis Charney, who have done a lot of work in looking at the impact on neural circuitry. So with all this in mind, we then see that there's a number of ways that, that neural circuitry is um, impacted through epigenetics and gene expression and through those psychological factors. So what is it that gets impacted in neural circuitry? Again, it really comes back to thinking about our adaptability and our stress response, having a balanced threat and reward response, an accurate appraisal of threat. Again, an ability to um, reevaluate sometimes what per are perceived to be a stressful or emotion eliciting event, often in a less threatening way. A good emotional regulation that's efficient, cognitive control, and again, stress response systems that are adaptable and again, respond appropriately to a stressor and come back to efficient recovery. There's all this wonderful accumulating evidence um, that many of the preventive and therapeutic interventions we use and we advocate for really have the potential to enhance resilience at the structural level, including things like parenting interventions, school-based mental health, um, community support programs, integrated care and pediatrics, trauma-focused interventions. The take home on this is what we do matters. It matters at a structural level and it can last into future generations. All right, so how are we gonna do it? How do we promote resiliency in children and youth and parents? So Anne Mastin, who is at the University of Minnesota has done some really fabulous work in this area. And she came up with sort of what she called these common resilience factors, the short list. She did something really interesting. She looked at resiliency science across different fields, individual resiliency, family resiliency, resiliency after war. These are all disciplines that were really in no communication with each other, but all coming up with what they thought were kind of key resilience factors. And she sort of mapped them to each other and found this remarkable consistency, just this incredible sort of overlap and she sort of was like, well, what's that about? That they, no, these disciplines who had no contact with, either, with each other, yet they all came up with the same resilience factors. And what she concluded is these are sort of what I'm about to show you, the kind of fundamental human adaptive systems that have kind of evolved over time and over generations of human biological and sociocultural evolution. 
these are the ingredients that I'm about to show you that form the essence, truly the essence of what it means to be an adaptive and well-functioning human being. So here they are. Sensitive caregiving, having connections and close relationships, rituals, routines, and traditions, self-efficacy, problem solving and flexibility, self-regulation, a motivation to succeed, optimism and hope, meaning and purpose, quality education and well-functioning communities. Now we don't have to have all of these qualities every day, all the time, but these are the kinds of things that really are what's going to promote resiliency in human beings. And I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. And I, I'll tell you, pay attention to it for our own selves too. Like where do we thrive and where, what might be missing? And also recognize that all of this is infused with cultural variation and religious and spiritual practice. So I'm gonna come back to that in a minute for the one interactive thing that I wanna to try to do during this talk. Now, Dennis Charney and um, Steve Southwick also did this really interesting study where they went and they asked these Navy SEALs who do all this high risk stuff that requires sort of so much courage and bravery. And they asked them, well, how do you do those risky things you need to do? And over and over, many answered, it's not just me, it's my squad. And what they learned from this was that somehow a sense of interconnection and interdependency is what really often allows people to do things that take courage and take bravery, if you will. That in fact, giving support may be as important as receiving support. So one thing I would just tell you is we need to be asking families, who's in your squad? And Steve Southwick says, when he sits with a family or a parent or an adult who he's seeing, very first thing he asks them is, all right, I want you to map out your squad. Show me, where do you give support to and where do you get support from? Now there's other ways to promote resilience. Exercise has been shown to enhance cognition, stress regulation and increase hippocampal size, things like meditation and mindfulness, and helping people cultivate realistic optimism, recognizing distorted predictions in either direction, overly ambitious that are not attainable or, or filled with negative distortions and ultimately creating opportunity for adversity. So we're very good at this. I've said this before when I said we focus on the cracks. It's part of the way many of us, at least those of us on this, who are here today in the medical world, um, you know, focus on a deficit model. Um, that's what we've been trained to do. But we now are trying to think about layering in a strength-based approach. You know, and it's funny, I'll tell you, before, as I've started to get deeper into looking at this kind of resilient science, I, I always felt like, personally, I paid a little more lip service to it than really understood what it truly means. There's very limited tools out there. There are great questionnaires that are sort of super amenable to being used, um, except in kind of research things or when you have a lot of time with families. But there's lots of things we can do to ask. Okay, so here's my one quick, um, my one quick uh, interactive thing. So just put it into the chat. I'm gonna go back to here to show you just so you can think about it, but go say whatever. What can you ask families to assess where they're at from a strength-based perspective and what their level of resiliency is? What do you feel like you can ask? And just throw it in the chat. Like there's, there's no wrong questions. So just questions you feel like, Like, what can you ask families? What happened? Okay. And, and again, we're trying to figure out resiliency. So I want you to think about strength-based approach. What are the kinds of things you can ask? How are you really doing? What rituals, traditions do you practice? Who's your child emergency coach with? Who do you call when you have difficulty? Who can you lean on? Do you have hope? Nice. Throw a few more in and then we'll go on. What makes you get up in the morning? What do you look forward to do? What do you like to do for fun together? Yeah. How would you practice self-care? What are you doing to help you and your family? God, they're coming fast and furious. What motivates you to succeed? Closest relationships. These are fabulous. These are fabulous. What are you proud of? What are the things you enjoy? Yeah. I mean, if we believe that these are, how do you solve problems? Yeah, what, what happens when things don't go exactly like you planned? These are not always questions we think to ask people, 
But these are the ways we can understand where is this family at in terms of their resilience? Where are they, where are they at? Okay, so let's go on and go back to where we were. Okay, so these are some of the pediatric um, interventions. And so, so many people on this call, I'm sure are doing all of working on behalf of families and children to do so many of these things. Number one is um, promotive interventions, parenting interventions to ensure stable, rich relationships, ensure that parents are emotionally available to their kids. You know, this should be in like giant letters. This is the most potent pediatric intervention, in my opinion, is figuring out how can we get, how can we help parents be the best parents that they want and can be, um, and be emotionally available to their children. But these other ones all tie into that, ensuring quality early childhood programs, identifying children in need of early intervention or special ed, creating safe spaces for play, guaranteeing communities have libraries and safe schools, promoting reading, implementing two generation solutions, ensuring that we are looking at not just children, but children who live in families and that unit, and then protective interventions, and then those laser-like interventions that we need to use to make sure that we, um, that we promote some resilience there, recognizing and treating trauma, linking parents to mental health programs, and stabilizing housing and food needs. So this is all very good. I'm just doing a time check. I think I'm doing okay. And we need to then think about um, making sure we individualize care and level the playing field. Because in fact, all children are not the same as I hopefully have pointed out to you. All children are not the same. All families are not the same. And so we need to make sure that we're targeting our interventions appropriately and putting them, putting our energies in the right places. So let me just spend another little bit talking about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the differential susceptibility hypothesis. And I put up here the picture of the dandelion and the orchid, which many of you may be familiar with. So the dandelion, often called a weed, I like to call it a flower. I'm quite fond after having read some of this work of the dandelion. Why? It just grows everywhere. It's hard to get rid of them. I guess that's why people call them weeds but they grow everywhere under the most adverse of, of settings. The orchid, on the other hand, needs a very specialized kind of environment. In the wrong environment, it withers, but in the right one, look at how beautiful it can become. The needs of the dandelion child and the orchid child are quite different, aren't they? And what we know is that there are some genetic variants confer greater vulnerability to environmental stimuli. There's been a lot of work looking at the dopamine and serotonin transporter genes, trying to understand risk status, if you will, of children. Now, it doesn't mean we should deny the dandelion, but it may mean that we need to think about who is who and who needs what and give people just what they need. The other thing we have to think about is in the, in the, with COVID, sort of what else, what matters about COVID? COVID's a big word. It's, a, you know, it's affected everybody, but it hasn't affected everybody the same. So what was functioning like before the pandemic? Because we know if you started off on rocky territory, you were much more likely to have more significant impact from COVID. How closely did the pandemic touch a family or a child? Did loss directly impact that family? How long has adversity lasted? You know, this has been a long time now, we're into two years already. You know, has it been the entirety of time? Was it a short blip? What, and, and how severe was it? What was the child and what is the child's age or developmental level? Children may not really understand the scope of COVID. Older children are more aware. Younger children are much more vulnerable to separation and loss. And older children are much more vulnerable to loss of peer relationships and, and involvement with their community. What is the family life cycle? How old are the kids in the family? What are the other things competing for parents' time within that family system? And who are the vulnerable? We know who they are, but let's just say it. Kids who are English language learners, children with disabilities, children living in poverty, homeless children, children of color, and children in the juvenile justice or foster care system. These kids are at such enormous risk for long-term consequences. I think I've showed you that, but I'm gonna show you a few more things 
to, to bring that home. Again, this is already outdated, but these are COVID death rates among older adults by race and ethnicity between January 2020 and January 2021. So if you look at an overall death rate of 631 per 100,000 people, for white people and for Asians, it is below that average. But when you look at Black, Hispanic, and Asian American, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, Native Americans, it's significantly higher. So we know that um, the, there is a much higher mortality among people of color. And remember what I told you before, for every death, you know, for every four deaths, there's a child who has lost a parent or caregiver and those sort of cycles, or if you will, are those waves of, of bereavement for every person who dies, for, there's nine people that are grieving. So we can see that there is a disproportionate touch of COVID on communities of color. And what does that mean then? It means that their COVID disparities are quite real and that children of color at a higher risk for so many things, trauma and loss, PTSD, a disproportionate impact on food, financial and housing security, educational loss and poor school readiness. If we do not think about this, if we do not address us now, in five to 10 years when there's huge gaps and tremendous inequity, are we gonna remember that it had its roots during this? And if not, shame on us for not acting now. I wanna to touch on one last thing and then I'm gonna finish up. So in addition to thinking about all these other things related to resilience in families and children, I think we wanna think about our own practice resilience and how the COVID has sort of, again, sort of go back to Bill Murray in Groundhog's Day, but thinking about we had an opportunity to imagine doing things differently. We had to, right? We just had to because all of a sudden no one was going into work. No one was, you know, we weren't seeing patients, for instance, in person. We had to challenge all of these beliefs that we had held so dearly, so tightly, and think about doing them in different ways. I think that's both scary and very exciting. And I want to go through one very quick example. So in my world, we started to do a lot of telehealth assessments and we started to do evaluations of young children for autism using a telehealth um, tool. The details of this aren't so important except to tell you a few things. It was short, it was for young children. We relied on parents. We had eight caregiver led activities. We relied on parents to do what we would normally do in the office. We kind of coached them through it. And we had a measure that you could score with a score of more than 11 suggestive of autism. And people were so skeptical. I was skeptical in the beginning. How could this possibly be helpful? But here's what we've learned. In a study that looked at the outcome of using the tele-ASDPs, 204 children, 71% of children were diagnosed using a telehealth assessment with a pretty high level of clinician certainty. An additional 11% were, um, were said, were determined to have no ASD with not quite as high a level of certainty, but still it's 82% of kids seen by telehealth. They were felt to have a fairly robust diagnosis and really only 18% of the sample did people say, yes, 100% you need to come back and be seen in person. I mean, that's kind of mind blowing because what it tells us is we can use these modalities to reach families that are difficult to reach. Waiting lists are insane around the country to be seen for these kinds of assessments. Using modalities like this can be novel ways to think about how do we see children and at least do kind of sometimes a first pass evaluation. So we have an opportunity to transform care, to use telehealth to reach hard to reach families, to consider innovative ways to evaluate and treat children, to be bold in our thinking about how we do things, to demand payment continues for telehealth, but also insist that it's not used as a cost-cutting measure, meaning you know, somebody halfway around the world is seeing your child will never see them again, and maybe that's not the world's greatest thing. So I come back to our friend Winston Churchill, and I will just say, you know, this was not the first disaster to strike humans. It will not be the last one, but we need to think about 
finding ways, using the information we gain from the COVID experience to find ways to learn how to plan, to identify gaps, understand where we need to put resources and look at issues of inequity. We learned a lot of things. You know, we learned when schools closed, there were more kids went hungry. We learned when schools closed, if you didn't have internet access, you couldn't learn. We saw that our healthcare systems, our mental health systems, and our schools really lacked the flexibility to pivot. Um, and we really have learned about the intense effect of isolation and being disconnected and fear on our youth. I also think we learned how very interdependent we are on each other to function at our best. So I conclude by just saying, many metrics of child well-being were just not that great pre-pandemic. The COVID pandemic increased risk and vulnerability of children and families. We are so tired, we are fed up, we're frustrated, million words, worn out, but we also have an opportunity to promote resilience, individualized care and innovate. And we need to understand that the imprint of COVID-19 will be felt for a long time. I thank you so much for your attention. And I hope we have time for a few questions and comments at the end. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Carol. I wish you could hear all the applause I hope people are giving you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was just such an amazing uh, presentation and so perfect for our empowering families theme. And you certainly um, achieved your, um, your learning objectives, I think. Um, just such really sobering statistics, especially thinking that those studies were from a year ago now. So it kind of no. scares me. Okay. Um, but thanks so much for reminding us to uh, power through our COVID fatigue and promote, uh, continue to promote resiliency in, in children and families. Um, so uh, lots and lots of thank yous over here. We do have time for a few questions. This, we did build in this um, half hour break before um, the first breakout session. So um, one easy one, um, the common resilience factors that you went back to, um, uh, one person, I just wanted a reminder of whose research is this? A lot of this research comes from the work of Ann Mastin, um, who's from the University of Minnesota. Okay. Um, and a comment, maybe a, a comment, and I hope you can comment on it. Hearing about what makes a person child resilient is highlighting even more for me the inequities in society. For example, sensitive parenting may not always be possible for a single mom working multiple jobs or quality education may not be accessible. So her comment, and maybe you could reflect on that comment. First of all, I think that's right. I think that we have seen, and we look, the, the inequity in this nation was, was abysmal beforehand. It's worse now. What I would say, I would just, I wanna, I, I wish I had that in my head exactly, because what I would reframe that to be saying is, what can, what do we need to do to allow that single mom to be able to be an emotionally available parent? And how do we ensure that there is appropriate early childhood education? That to me is the stance of it, of saying, how do we, how do we bolster the resiliency of that family, that community, um, and that child therefore? So I don't know if that helps. Yes, I think that's that's so true. And I think that your uh, your talk just gave me hope that I can do this on a daily basis, even in, in my practice and really try to help bolster those families because we see them all the time. You are certainly uh, uh, speaking to a group that can help uh, um, make a difference to those families for sure. Um, I, um, then there was one that says, I am all for positivity and optimism. One problem that I am having for many of our conversations around resilience ignores some of the very real impacts COVID has had on children and families, particularly mental health and social emotional development. How can we know what, which resilience is good resilience? I guess, I, okay, that's a complicated one. So <laughs> Dr. Macias, you'll help me out with that. And so, and that was a lot of words you just said. So there's such a thing as true optimism and a sort of false optimism. So this is not about false optimism, like, yeah, everything's gonna be great. That's nonsense, you know? And in fact, there are too many people in this country, too many who wanna say, oh yeah, COVID's done, we're done, everything's great. That's not resilience. That's not what we are talking about. 
we're talking about people feeling a true felt sense of the, the world, that there is something to look forward to and cultivating hope. That is very different than the superficial of, yeah, everything's great, let's stay, let's stay positive. You know, I find that actually almost insulting to people who are experiencing the adversity you talk about in that comment. So the answer is, say the second part of it about the adversity part, which say that um, one more time. About the adversity, or just, um, they feel that some of these conversations just ignore the, the impact of the, the mental health and social emotional development of children. It's it's a hundred percent. Of course they do because when we try to be, there's the dismissive thing that I'm that you're. I feel like you're highlighting, which is being, you know, oh yeah, let's just feel good. Let's it's all over now. Let's just move on. You betcha. We absolutely must recognize that. But I think that truly the ultimate way that we are going to heal people, heal ourselves, heal our country, is by figuring out. How are we going to cultivate the things that we know promote adaptation in human beings? And those resiliency factors, allowing, figuring out a way to help people find motivation, hope, to develop skills around self-efficacy, cognitive reappraisal. Those are the core features that are going to allow people to, to, to adapt and to, to manage well. And by the way, I just want to say, it's not so easy like we think, oh, those resiliency things, great. It takes a lot of work and effort to cultivate those skills in people, especially when people have felt hopeless, have had no motivation. It's not like you just go, hey, you know what? You should feel hopeful. This is very hard work. And I do not want anyone to walk out thinking that we should diminish the amount of work that it takes to help people actually develop resiliency. So I hope yes. that answered that question. Yes, agree. That very good points. Um, just some, a few comments that I want to say are that are in the mm -hmm. chat. Uh, your presentation teaches us that COVID has had a ripple effect on children and their families. Um, also, your uh, information reminds me of uh, Bronfenbrenner's important work Absolutely. and how we all live within the concentric circles of possible uh, sources of support. So yeah, absolutely. Um, many, many auto, uh, awesome um, comments. And um, one, yes, sobering statistics, but the presentation does make me feel hopeful and how to build resilience. I completely agree. And um, that it gives them hope that, that even though it's difficult, uh, she said, uh, Karen Eirich, I'll give a shout out to her because she's our family faculty for South Carolina Lend um, and said, uh, most importantly, thank you for the hope. So thank you for the insight and important information, but thank you for the hope. Um, and uh, one of our fellows at MUSC just updated statistics, uh, 5.2 million children have lost a caregiver to COVID globally um, with that link in the chat box as well. So that was just updated yesterday. So as you said, we are not done yet. <laughs> we should, um, uh, we have to combat our COVID fatigue and continue to work with families. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over that. Thanks so much to the audience for your attention, even though I can't see you. I know you've been very attentive. Um, <laughs> Dr. Weitzman, that was just awesome. And we will get you to South Carolina sometime. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. As the snow comes down around me in Connecticut, I am looking forward to it. You will have to see beautiful Greenville, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just wanted to all of the, to the, all of the, to the audience, thank you for joining us. And once again, if you are claiming South Carolina Endeavors credit, please make sure you've completed the Google form um, that is in the chat box um, for you to link to. Um, any problems, let us know with that. Uh, we'll be providing a recording of this session to all attendees uh, via email in the coming days um, next, next week. Um, thank you again, Dr. Weitzman, and to, um, uh, to everyone for all the work you do. So have a great and day. My last comment oh, is yes, please. My <laughs> last comment to all of you is to simply say, pay attention also to your own feelings of resilience and cultivate those and look for the places where, because we've all been through this too. You know, we're doing a ton of work to help other people, but cultivate your own feelings of of, of resilience also. And on that note, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks everyone.